ان الحمد لله تعالى نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه اما بعد فان استقى الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار إخواني we're talking about a very very important topic today and that is the authority and the importance of the sunnah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم we live in a time when subhanallah various aspects of this deen are being misrepresented or being denied or being uh, contorted and subhanallah the Muslims are in a sad state and it's got to the state now where we find many Muslims saying show me this from the Quran and they totally disregard the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam so for example you will give them a ruling of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salam and the first thing that they will say is show me this from the Quran and if it's not in the Quran then they just won't accept it they'll say well if you can't show me from the Quran then I'm not interested bring your proof from the Quran otherwise I'm not interested I'm not going to listen to you and what they've actually done is they've separated and they've divided between the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam it's important to note before we begin that that word sunnah, this word sunnah, it has various definitions. Various definitions and depending on which uh, branch of Islamic science that we are talking about, that word sunnah carries a different meaning for each branch. So, for example, we have the usuli, or the one, sorry, the one who is dealing in fiqh. He wants to know the level of this action. So, you know, in general, something which is a sunnah according to the faqih, somebody who, who deals in the fiqhi rulings, he will say that a sunnah, it's not quite the level of an obligatory action, however, it's more than something permissible. So it's something recommended in general. Then we have those scholars of aqidah, and they will use this term sunnah, and it refers to the whole religion. It refers to the whole religion. So for example, Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, he has a book, and it's just called the Sunnah. But this is talking about the whole creed of Islam. When we say Sunnah, what we are talking about are those words, those actions, those tacit approvals of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is their level within this religion? Is it something which we can just take the Quran and completely disregard them? Or do these action sayings, tacit approvals of the Prophet salam hold very real weight within our religion. Of course, if somebody doesn't accept the authentic hadith or if somebody doesn't accept the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, then there's no point bringing a hadith to try and show them the importance of the sunnah because they simply won't accept it. So what we're going to do ta'ala, is look at some ayat of the Qur'an. Look at some ayat from the Qur'an in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He, in His immense wisdom, His glory and His knowledge, He sets the station of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first ayah that I'm going to bring to you is from Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 80, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَنْ يُطَعِ الرَّسُولَ فَقَدْ عَطَاءَ Allah." He who obeys the messenger of Allah, then he has in fact obeyed Allah. Subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set the precedence here. If you obey the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then what you are actually doing is you are obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Elsewhere, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُبَاعِئُونَكَ إِنَّمَا يُبَاعِئُونَ Allah." Indeed, those who pledge allegiance to you, they are actually pledging allegiance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is in Surah Fatih. Uh, ayah number 10. I just want to focus on these two ayat to begin with. 
That he who obeys the messenger has obeyed Allah. He who pledges allegiance to the messenger has actually pledged his allegiance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This subhanallah, it proves a very important point to us. If we want to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is not a single path that will bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except that it is the path that was taken by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if we seek to take a path other than the path that was taken by the Prophet alayhi salam and by the companions, then there is no way that this path will bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, it will take us further away from Him. Indeed, those who pledge allegiance to you, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention this? How can we as Muslims today, living over 1400 years, pledge allegiance to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? This is the way of following his sunnah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So those things that he commanded us with, we follow them. Those things that he forbade us from, we stay away from them. So we take him, we pledge our allegiance to him when we take the shahada and we declare that he is the messenger of Allah, then this means that we also acknowledge that there is no path that will lead us closer to Allah except by following the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Surah An-Nisa, Ayah 59. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu ati'u Allah wa ati'u rasul wa ulil amri minkum. O you who have believed, Obey Allah, obey the messenger, and those in authority over you. Let's look at the way this ayah has been constructed. Allah wa Rasul wa ulil amri minkum. Obey Allah, obey the messenger, and those in authority over you. Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, Obey Allah, obey the messenger, and obey those in authority over you? Instead, he said, Obey Allah. This means you have no option but to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obey the messenger. This means you have no option but to obey the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then Allah says, and those in authority over you. But he doesn't say, obey those in authority over you. This means we only obey those in authority over us as long as it does not include the disobedience to Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَإِن تَزَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ وَأَحْسَنُ تَأْوِيلًا And if you disagree over anything, this is the same ayah, and if you disagree over anything, refer it back to Allah and the Messenger if you believe in Allah and the last day. This is the best and the best in result. So if you believe in Allah, if you truly believe, in Allah and the last day, then if you disagree in anything, anything, not just anything in the religion, Ikhwani, but anything in our day-to-day -day lives. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he states that the way that this ayah is formed, it means that if you disagree over anything, if there is any disagreement amongst you, bring it back to Allah, bring it back to His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That is better for you in the dunya and in the akhirah. Now, when the companions, they heard this ayah, of course, if there was any disagreement amongst them, they could go directly to the Prophet ﷺ and ask him face to face. But can we do that? The answer is no, we can't. So we take it back to the book of Allah and we take it back to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. As Muslims, of course, we all want to obtain the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to love us. We all want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. Allah has given us the keys to his mercy and his forgiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ali Imran, Ayah number 31, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبُكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Say, if you truly, really love Allah, then follow me. Then follow me. Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. Truly, Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. So a group of people, they came to the Prophet 
declaring their undying love for him. We love you, Ya, ya Rasulullah. We have so much love for you, Ya Rasulullah. Subhanallah, this is the acid test. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah. Say, if you say to them, O Muhammad, alayhi salam, if you truly love them, then follow me. And Allah will love you and forgive you of your sins. Ikhwani, subhanallah, this is, should be a motivation for us. I want Allah to forgive me for my sins. I want Allah to love me, the one whom I am doing all of this for. If I want to attain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no path that will get me that love except following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Surah Ali Imran again, ayah number 132. And obey Allah and the Messenger that you may obtain mercy. Subhanallah. You want the mercy of Allah. In one ayah, Allah says He will forgive you of your sins. The other ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying you will obtain mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let's not forget that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in an authentic hadith that nobody will enter Jannah based on his deeds alone. So nobody will enter Jannah simply based on his deeds. You know, he's done so many good deeds that he deserves this amazing blessing from Allah. And the companion said, not even you, Ya Rasulullah. So not even you deserve Jannah based on your deeds alone. And the Prophet ﷺ said, not even me. Even I need the mercy of Allah to enter into Jannah. So subhanallah, do we want the mercy of Allah? What does Allah say? Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. Why doesn't Allah only say, obey Allah, that you may obtain His mercy? Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala joining every single time in the Quran? Allah says, obey Allah. He also says, obey the Messenger. Why? To leave absolutely no doubt in our minds, Ikhwani. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, ati'ullaha wa rasoolahu wa la tawallaw anhu wa antum tasma'oon. O you who have believed, obey Allah and His Messenger and do not turn away while you hear His order. Surah, al Surah Anfal, ayah number 20. You have heard the authentic hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is an order, a direct order from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Are you going to turn away? Allah says, O oh, you who believe, do not turn away. Do not turn away while you have, hear, while you have heard the command. Ikhwani, actually in the Quran, there are over 50 ayat, over 50 ayat in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets out for us the authority and importance of the sunnah. Over 50 different places in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, uh, you know, follow the sunnah, obey Allah, obey his messenger. Do not turn away from Allah and his messenger. What the messenger gives you, then take it. What the messenger forbids you from, then abstain from it. Over 50 places, subhanallah. In fact, one place is enough. One place is enough, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it in over 50 places places in the Quran. We all know that as Muslims, part of our aqidah is that we only take an oath by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nowadays we find people, I swear on my mother's life, I swear on this, my children, my grandparents, all of this, this is not permissible in Islam. We can only swear, on, make our oath by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his glory, out of his honor, he can swear by whatever he likes. He has created everything and he is the owner of all things. Wal-fajr, wal-asr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears many, many times. But the greatest oath that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes in the Quran is by himself. By himself, Allah takes an oath. So we know that when Allah takes an oath by himself, then what is about to follow is going to be extremely, extremely important. Allah says, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ But no, by your Lord. Allah takes an oath by the Lord of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah takes an oath by himself. But no, by your Lord. They can have no faith. They will not truly believe. 
But know by your Lord they will not truly believe until they make you a judge in all disputes between them. And then they find in themselves no resistance against your decisions and they accept them with full submission. So, subhanAllah, it's worth stopping on this ayah. Firstly, Allah takes an oath by Himself that they're not going to truly believe. One of us, our beard can be to the floor, our thobe can be just, you know, halfway up between our shins. But Allah says, But know by your Lord they will not truly believe until they make you a judge in all of their disputes. Any dispute that they have, any decision that they want, they make you as a judge. And then, and then, they completely accept your decision and they find no resistance in their heart. Subhanallah, this is something for us to think about. When an authentic hadith of the Prophet ﷺ comes to us, do we try and find ways to sidetrack it? Do we try and look at ikhtilaf, differences amongst the scholars? Do we try and go fatwa fishing? Do we approach Sheikh Google to come to another fatwa? But no, subhanallah, we need to accept the, or the judgment of the Prophet ﷺ without any, without any resistance in our heart. Let's look, subhanallah, at the punishment for those. So firstly, Allah sets up the station of the sunnah. We know that we need to obey Allah, we need to obey the messenger, we need to take his judgments, i.e. his sunnah, without any resistance. When it comes to us, if it's authentic and we have understood it and applied it collect, uh, correctly, then we should have no resistance in our heart on top of this. But subhanallah, look then, Allah elsewhere in the Quran mentions the punishment or the dangers that those who don't follow the sunnah, I just follow the Quran. I don't need to follow the sunnah. My love Allah. Look at the dangers that they are facing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُصْلِهِ جَهَنَّمْ وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا And whoever opposes the messenger after the guidance has become clear to him. A brother brings you an authentic hadith. A brother explains that hadith. A, bring, a brother brings you the interpretations or the applications of the scholars of that hadith. So the way has become clear to you. The way has become clear to you. And he follows. So whoever op opposes the messenger after the guidance has become clear to him. And he follows a way other than the way of the believers. Other than the way of the believers. We will give him what he has taken and drive him into hell. What an evil resting place. Who are the believers? Are the believers me and you? When this ayah was revealed, who were the believers? This is the way of the companions. Radiallahu anhum ajma'in. So, the way of the messenger has become clear to you. You've turned away. You've turned away from the way of the companions by default. Because the way of the companions was the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So if you've turned away from one, by definition, by default, you've turned away from the other. Allah says, we will leave him to what he is doing. And then we will drive him into Jahannam. What an evil resting place. What about the other way? What about the opposite side of the coin? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah An-Nisa, Ayah 13. Tilka hududullah, wa man yuta'il rasoola, lahu yut... Subhanallah. تلك حدود الله ومن يطع الرسول له يدخله جنة تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها وذلك الفوز العظيم. These are the limits set by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger, he will be admitted by Allah into gardens underneath which rivers flow. Gardens underneath which rivers flow, and he will be there forever. This is the great supreme success. Ikhwani, look at the reward. On one side you have the warning from Allah. Don't turn away from Allah and His Messenger. Don't turn away from the companions radiallahu anhum. Then you have the motivation. If you follow Allah, you obey Allah and the Messenger, you will have Jannah. You will have Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a, I feel, an issue or 
an ayah which I'm just going to read to you the English translation from Surah Al Ahzab, ayah number 36. I think this is an issue particularly when we have a marriage or we have a death. This, in my opinion, is when we see how much people truly love Allah and they truly love the Messenger of His Sunnah, the Sunnah of His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because at the time of a death or at the time of a wedding, this is when there are other people around. This is when the people will congregate. This is when the people will talk. And this is when you see those people who don't care about what he or she says. They care about what Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have said. So from experience you find that these are the times when people at when people congregate. This is when you truly see how much somebody loves Allah and His Messenger. Because if they don't, or that love is weak in their heart, then they want to please the people. They want to please the people over pleasing Allah, over following the sunnah of his Prophet alayhi salatu salam. It is not for a believing man or a believing woman when Allah and his messenger have decided a matter that they should thereafter have any choice about their affair. And whoever disobeys Allah and his messenger has certainly strayed into clear error. It's not for a believing man or believing woman. So there's no excuse that I'm a man or I'm a woman. This has been very clearly mentioned by Allah. If you're a believer, man or woman, then it's not for you that once Allah and His Messenger have decided something, once Allah has told you something in the Quran, or the Prophet ﷺ has told us something in the Sunnah, once that affair has been decided, then it's not for us to have a choice. We don't have a choice after this. Once the way has been made clear to us, we don't have a choice. We don't put our own ideas across. We don't try and sidestep this one or pretend like we never received that one or we didn't know about this one. We just have to follow blindly the Quran and the Sunnah because Allah knows what is good for us better than we know what is good for ourselves. Many of the scholars, Imam Malik rahimahullah, he said we don't follow anybody blindly. There is not a single person who we follow blindly except that man who is in that grave. And he was talking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now we have established from the Quran the importance of the Sunnah. Now we've established from the Quran the importance that Allah has given to the Sunnah. The importance that Allah has mentioned. Follow it. Don't turn away from it. If you follow it, you will have Jannah. If you turn away from it, we will drive you into Jahannam. Now let's look at some sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In a hadith which is, rec which is recorded by Imam Bukhari rahimahullah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ لَا يُؤْمِنُ أَحَدُكُمْ حَتَّى أَكُونَ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْهِ مِن نَفْسِهِ وَمَالِهِ وَوَلَدِهِ وَالنَّاسِ أَجْمَعِينَ By the one in whose hand is my soul, by the one in whose hand is my soul, none of you truly believes until I am dearer to him than his own self, than his wealth, his children and all of the people combined. You do not truly believe until the Prophet ﷺ becomes more beloved to you than your own self. Then all of your wealth, all of your wealth, then your children and your family, in fact, then all of the people combined, one nasi ajma'een. So the question is this, if you love the Prophet ﷺ, you claim to love Allah, how is it that you can turn away from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ when he himself has told you that your faith will not be complete until you love him more than anything else or anyone else. And of course, if you love him this much, then you're going to follow him and you're not going to question his commandments. You will follow first and then look for the wisdom. Many times you say or you hear about people, you know, I'm researching about praying five times a day. Once I know fully the wisdoms, then I'll start praying five times a day. This is the incorrect approach. Rather, the approach is to pray five times a day and then the wisdoms will become clear to you after that. Pray five times a day, implement the sunnah, and then you won't even need to research. The wisdom of the sunnah will become clear to you bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said in a hadith which is recorded by Imam Malik, 
Al-Hakim and Bayhaqi, I have left among you two things. I have left among you two things that if you adhere to them, you will never be misguided. Important point, two things. Not one thing, two things. And he said, the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you adhere to them, you will never be misguided. If you stick to them, you will never be misguided. He didn't say one thing. He didn't say, I've left amongst you the book of Allah. And if you stick to it, you will never go astray. He said, I've left amongst you two things. The book of Allah and the sunnah, the way, the tacit approvals, the actions, all of the things that he told us, his commandments, his uh, things that he forbade us from. Everything that has come from the Prophet wasallam. Two things, his book and his sunnah. The book of Allah, the sunnah of his messenger. And if you adhere to them, you will never go astray. Subhanallah. This hadith that I'm about to mention to you, which is recorded by Bayhaqi, Imam Ahmad, Abu Dawood, Tirmadi, Ibn Majah, and Shaykh Al-Albani rahimahullah said this is an authentic hadith. You could literally take this hadith and apply it to many people living today. You could literally, word for word, this hadith applies to so many of the people of the Muslims. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, I had better not find any one of you reclining on his bed. So he's just relaxing. He's sitting there. And there comes to him one of my commandments or one of my prohibitions. And he says about it, I do not know. We only follow what we find in the book of Allah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, I had better not find any one of you that he's sitting there and somebody gives the command of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or his prohibition and he says, mm, actually, you know what? I don't know. Give it to me from the Quran. The Prophet alayhi sallam said, I had better not find any one of you doing that. Look how important that was. Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, all of my nation will enter into paradise except for those who refuse. The companions said, who will refuse, Ya Rasulullah? The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever obeys me will enter into paradise and whoever disobeys me has refused. A hadith recorded by At-Tabarani, Shaykh Al-Albani rahimahullah said, Hadithun Sahih, there is nothing left that takes one closer to paradise or distances you from the hellfire, except that I have made it clear to you. Ikhwani, there is no point us coming up with new ways to worship Allah, new paths to try and get close to Allah, because there is not a single path that will take, a, take us closer to Allah or take us away from the hellfire, except that the Prophet ﷺ has made it clear for us, clear for us, crystal clear for us. The Prophet ﷺ said, the best of all people is my generation, then those who follow them, then those who follow them. Let's look at this generation. Let's look at the best of those generations. How did they understand these ayat which we have mentioned? How did they understand these statements that the Prophet ﷺ made? Abu Bakr radiallahu an, the best of this ummah. He says, I have not left anything that the Prophet ﷺ used to do except that I also act upon it. I fear that if I were to leave any of his commands, I would go astray. I would become deviated. He never said, I never left anything that Allah commanded. Rather, he said, I never left anything that the Prophet ﷺ commanded except that I also did it. Why? Because what Allah commands you with it's the same as what the Prophet ﷺ commands you with. What he commands you with is the same as the command of Allah. Whoever obeys the Messenger has obeyed Allah. Whoever pledges allegiance to the Messenger, he is in actual fact pledging allegiance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another important one, you say to the brother, Akhi, don't smoke. Akhi, did you know smoking weed is haram? Akhi, did you know that the beard is an obligation upon you. Akhi, this is what the Prophet ﷺ, he commanded us with. And he will say, brother, find me this from the Qur'an. Find me this from the Qur'an. Well, there was an instance that just something similar like this happened. Bukhari and Muslim, they both narrate that Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anh, he said 
that Allah curses the one who tattoos, the one who asks to be tattooed, the one who plucks the eyebrows, the one who files her teeth to change the creation of Allah. This reached one of the female companions, radiallahu anha, Umm Yaqub. So she came to Ibn Masood radiallahu an and she said, it has reached me that you have said such and such, what we've just mentioned. He said, what is wrong with me? Are you saying there's something wrong with me if I curse what the Messenger of Allah has cursed and what is found in the book of Allah? Listen, he has talk, sp spoken about those who pluck their eyebrows, those who tattoo, those who ask to be tattooed, those who file their teeth. And he says, what's... And it reaches, you know, somebody says to Umm um Yaqub, this is what Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu an has said. And she says, she comes to him and she says, is this what you said? This is what you've said. He says, well, what's the problem? Why are you saying there's something wrong with me? If I'm cursing the one who the messenger has cursed and what is found in the book of Allah. It's in the book of Allah. So she came to him and she said, she answered him, I have read the Quran from cover to cover, yet I have not found what you have stated. I've not mentioned, I've not found anything about tattoos or plucking the eyebrows or filing the teeth. I've read it from cover to cover, it's not there. Abdullah radiallahu an, he said, if you had truly read it, then indeed you would have found it there. Did you not read the statement of Allah? Verily, what the messenger gives you, take it, and what he forbids you from, stay away from it. She said, yes. He replied, the Messenger of Allah forbade those things. So that one statement in Surah Al-Hashr, what the Prophet ﷺ gives you, then you should take it. What he forbids you, stay away from it. Then all of his prohibitions, all of his commandments are found in the Quran. It's a direct order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to, to obey Allah and to obey His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now let's look at some scholars of the Sunnah. Ibn Khuzayma rahimahullah, he says, No one can say anything if the Messenger of Allah has already spoken about that topic and it comes to us through a sound chain. So we're talking about, Allahu alam, let's talk about the, the beard for example and people are giving their own interpretations oh this it was a custom it was this it was that it was this it was that this scholar is saying that you do not have a say on the matter when an authentic narration of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam comes to you about that topic so when it comes to you keep your mouth shut keep your mouth shut because by saying something you're going to be going against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam Mujahid rahimahullah, he says, we accept some statements and we reject other statements of everybody except for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As for his statements, we accept them all and we do not reject a single one of them. Urwa rahimahullah, he says, following the sunnah is to establish the religion. According to him, you cannot establish Islam correctly if you do not follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, if the hadith is authentic, that is my madhab. Imam Malik, take whatever of my opinions is in agreement with the book and the sunnah and leave what is not in accordance with them. Ikhwani, the statements are so many, subhanallah. The ayat are so many. The authentic hadith are so many. We've only bought you just a selection, a handful to try and achieve two things with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first thing is to establish the authority and the sunnah, the authority and the importance of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You simply will not have complete faith. You simply cannot expect to attain the mercy, forgiveness, love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you do not follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And secondly, this is to refute those people who just say, we follow the Qur'an. We follow the Qur'an. Because as Aisha radiallahu anha was asked when she was replied, when she was asked about the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, she simply said his character was the Qur'an. 
There is no way to distinguish. You cannot separate them. You cannot separate them. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He doesn't speak from His own desires. Rather, it is revelation that is inspired in Him. So ikhwani, I hope that inshallah, a reminder to myself, to you brothers, take this message to those who are absent. Perhaps they will understand it better than we do. We need to follow the Qur'an, but we also need to follow the Sunnah. Our faith is not complete until we establish our faith and our belief and our life upon these two pillars, which is the Qur'an and the Sunnah, with the understanding or the authentic understanding of the companions. Radiallahu anhum ajma'een. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayh.